Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Charlotte Rathert. I am a veterinarian that prefers to work with goats and sheep. I practiced for about 16 years and focused on small ruminant medicine. And then I was the small ruminant specialist for the state of Missouri at Lincoln University up until just about a year and a half ago. And now I am working with USDA and veterinary services and regulatory medicine because Extension lost their funding and so hence I didn't have a job. <laughs> but I still have a passion for <clears throat> Uh, using goats and sheep for um, brush control or invasive vegetation control and that's what I did my research on for probably about five years while I was at Lincoln um, and so I'm going to share some of my my information and some of my information came from Dr. Steve Hart as well um, so anyway so basically, biological control agents um, would be your sheep and goats. These um, are things that you could use um, and be more aware of your environmental impacts. Um, you do, they don't require um, the use of herbicides or pesticides or a fuel. Um, it's called targeted grazing, basically, if you're going after a certain species of plant or area. Um, goats are, can be used um, more or less for brush control and sheep are more efficient with broadleafs or the weeds. Um, and then uh, Dr. Hart did some research back in 2001 looking at the economical um, benefits and profit method. So the benefits, basically, like I said, it cuts down on fertilizer, because what do sheep and goats do? They just automatically fertilize as they go along, right? And it's very concentrated, so their pellets are very, very concentrated. And they scatter them as they go. Um, you don't have as much herbicide use or pesticides. Um, and your feed inputs are reduced, because they're eating the weeds that you're having to worry about, or you're not having to manually go out there and hire somebody to have that expense. Um, the soil moisture losses, there's been research done that shows that there is a reduction in the soil moisture loss and erosion using the sheep and goats, as well as um, your livestock, if you're using them in the brush where, like Nancy said, you can't get machinery or equipment, then you already have automatic shade for the animals and they're quite comfortable out there. Um, and ultimately, you can increase your net farm um, profits or income because you can um, basically develop this into a business. I have several associates or colleagues that have done this. Um, you can also have a secondary product, a meat or milk. Um, dairy goats don't make, it's not recommended to do dairy goats so much because of the trauma to the udder um, when they're out there with the brush and stuff. Sometimes you can cause some trauma to their udders. But you can get a meat product and a leather product. Um, goat leather is what they use to make the tops of drums, if you knew that. And then there's goat, um, some of the best gloves I've had are goat gloves, <laughs> goat leather gloves. And I saw that they're also making goat leather boots now too are available, so. The objectives here are to manage your forage to meet your animal's nutritional needs. Um, also maintain your pasture condition and the available forage. So you can do this by rotation. Um, you don't wanna just throw them out there and let them go eat whatever, whenever. Like Nancy said, you need to rotate them and restrict them to areas so that you can keep your brush and your vegetation sustainable for the animals. This is a great way to manage your parasite control. In my research um, with the vegetation control, I showed that you can actually control your parasite loads. We just had um, probably, we started out with 80 different goats, different breeds. We had the boar, savanna, Kiko, and Spanish goats to compare. We divided them up into different mixed groups and we monitored their abilities to eat um, the browse as well as I monitored their parasite loads almost on a monthly basis. Um, and we showed that there was actually a decline in the parasite loads as long as we had good vegetation that was good nutritionally. Um, and then they also keeps them from, like Nancy mentioned, um, eating so close to the ground that they're re-ingesting their parasite larva. So you want to keep their heads up. Um, we were able to manage uh, with NRCS's help. I uh, had a site up in North of here in St. Louis, um, in Ellsbury, NRCS was my partner, and we um, cleaned up about 30 acres of um, buckthorn and um, honeysuckle. 
So what you've got right now is the first year on the project, um, we used hair sheep. Okay, but the problem is, is we found out that they're not aggressive browsers. They won't, they'll only eat as far as they can reach without leaving the ground. Goats, on the other hand, will actually jump up and break things down. So we were more successful with the goats wiping out the honeysuckle and buckthorn because they would actually take and bend over the stalks. And if you've ever seen, one goat, dominant goat, will knock it over, and the rest of them will converge on it, and they're just like piranhas out there. They just strip <laughs> it. And then you have a stick that just comes away back up. Hey, Terry, how are you? <laughs> anyway, um, so they're really, it's really fun to watch them go after this. Um, but yeah, they're um, quite more aggressive than um, the sheep. And so the top was one of my goats enjoying the area. So your strategy is basically um, you want to utilize proper stocking rates. Um, a lot of times what I run into is that when I, people are wanting to do this, they actually go too far one way and put too many animals for the amount of feed and land that they have. So try to work conservatively. You can always add more, but when you've got too many, what are you going to do with all those extras? And it's a little harder to get rid of them. <laughs> um, so you want to match your numbers to the carrying capacity of your land. Uh, you want to utilize the grazing behavior of those animals to meet your needs. So believe it or not, goats and sheep do graze a little bit differently. Goats like plants with high in tannins, and the sheep will eat them as well, but goats have a higher tolerance for really high tannin content. And those tannins, at the certain types of tannins, actually benefit in the parasite control. Okay, they're actually a benefit. They inhibit the parasite um, loads. Proper grazing heights, you want to make sure if your um, intention is to uh, eliminate the vegetation, that's one way to manage it. Or if you want to make that vegetation sustainable, there's different things you can do for there. And then browse versus weeds. Um, so how many goats and sheep can you stock? Oh, some of these slides I um, have I've received from Mark Kennedy. He used to be a grazing specialist with NRCS. So the, your stocking rates will vary by forage quality and production, um, the rainfall, amount, and distribution. So on my research project, we when we first went up to NRCS, we had just a thicket of honeysuckle. You couldn't even see, like, a foot in front of you beyond that. You couldn't see into the woods at all. It was so thick. So um, the goats did great the first couple of years they were up there. And then um, we had a year with really heavy rain, and which followed a drought. We had a couple of years of drought, and this is like maybe in 2011 and 2012, if you all remember. And then that following spring, we had a ton of rain, and it flooded everywhere in Missouri here. So it was so wet, the ground was so wet that the goats couldn't even get out of the mud and they were on a hill. And the, I used donkeys for guard animals and so the donkeys would make an imprint of their foot in the soil and it would fill up with water. That's how saturated the ground was. Well, when we had the goats and we'd bring them in and we'd weigh them on a weekly basis to monitor them in this, in this situation. Plus, their feet were never able to get out of the moisture, so that was another issue. But we noticed that they were losing weight on all this flush vegetation that we had. It was beautiful, and we thought that's really strange. Well, it turns out that when you have a lot of rain like that, your plants grow great, but most of the content, the nutritional content is water, not so much protein. So the goats needed to be supplemented. So these are things you have to think about when Mother Nature kind of throws your curveball, and it looks better than it actually is. So lesson learned there. Um, plant species, there's just pretty much nothing goats won't eat, but there are a few things. Um, and they're pretty smart about what they'll eat and what they won't eat. Okay, they can kind of figure it out. Um, sheep, on the other hand, sometimes aren't as careful as their selection, but, and they can get themselves in a little bit of trouble. But um, overall, they both do pretty good. Uh, time and year and month and season, we kind of just discussed that. Uh, soil fertility, uh, you always want to do soil sampling just to 
keep up on that, but the pellets from the goats and sheep will add some new fertility back into the soil. So you just kind of monitor that to see how you're improving your soil without having to make any major additi additives with fertilizers. Amount of supplementation, that's going to depend on your amount of forage and the quality of your forage. So just like I said, the forage that summer looked really great, but it wasn't adding much nutrition to the goats. Or the, so we had to supplement them a little bit to get them through that. And we did find out that the nutrition value had a lot to do with their health as well, because since their nutrition value wasn't so great, we were having a lot of health problems on goats that I had been selecting over the years for no health problems. And then these were the cream of the crop kind of goats I had. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to see some health issues with them because of the stress of the lack of nutrition. So again, something to think about. Your grazing management. Do you plan to do continuous grazing, rotational grazing, or um, intensive, like mob grazing? You've got to have a plan. So think about what you want to do for your land and what's best for you. We all work really hard at other jobs, usually off of our farms. So we also have to think about how we're going to incorporate this with all of what else we do. Your stocking rates. This is a guideline. Um, and I say, I stress guideline that Mark Kennedy put together um, a few years back. But anyway, he's kind of gone through and uh, devised this as to what you would have per acre. So for excellent pasture, you'd have like one cow per acre, or you could put five to six sheep per acre possibly, or six to eight goats, or one cow and one to two goats maybe if you're gonna do multi-species grazing. Um, like I said, this is a guideline. I tend to err on the side of the lower number just to make sure it's going to work because not everything is what it appears to be. Um, so for like br brush eradication, you can put up to 8 to 12 goats per acre and wipe it out, you know. Um, or if you want it sustainable, you're going to back that off to 1 to 3 goats per acre. Okay, so it just depends on what your ultimate goal is and what you need to do and what your land is about. Excuse me, yes? That previous slide? Uh-huh. Please, because Mark's explained this one to me, too. Okay, did I explain it wrong? If you can put a cow on three acres, say, then you can put five to six larger animals on that same three acres. So it's first find out what your cow equivalent is, because NRCS oh, okay. will tell you that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just a ratio. Okay. So, so and I not just per acre. It's, it's not per acre. How okay. many acres, acres do you have? No, and how many you need to support one cow? Oh, okay. So so one cow, one acre. Am I, I'm not getting that still. <laughs> hey, Dr. Lagunball. Per cow. Yeah. It just depends yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Three acres. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say where I come from. Yeah, it's a ratio, not a. Yeah. It's a ratio, I guess. Yeah. Because. That's what I was trying to say. Because where, where I come from, eight. it would be one cow per six acres. Yeah. Because I'm from the desert west, so um, it's a whole different ball game out here, and I've had to learn to do things real differently. So yeah, grazing thing is still throws me a curveball. Well, thank you, Linda. <laughs> So um, what effects an animal will consume also, you've got to think about this, um, the availability of other plant species. The animals really like diversification when they're eating. Um, it's just like us. We don't like to go to the salad bar and all there is a spinach, do we? <laughs> We'd rather have different types of lettuce or different things to put on our salad. So anyway, they're the same way, pretty much. They like some diversification in their diet. Um, the season of the year has a lot to do with it, summer versus spring or fall. Um, and what species of plants are actually growing during that season. I've noticed on my goats that they will eat certain plants during the spring um, and not touch anything or other plants during the spring and summer, but in the fall they'll come back and get those plants. So it just depends and they seem to have a sixth sense that they can figure that out faster than I can. And the presence of, if you have other grazing animals in, as well, um, what species of plants that the animals were exposed to as um, young. So a lot of times there's some maternal education that goes on here. And so the parents or the dam will teach the young what to eat and what not to eat. 
um, and they'll kind of mimic that as they go through their day. And their animals' personal preference. Some goats prefer certain things or sheep, and then they'll, the, the next one will go eat something totally different. Um, like on my, my little ha place, our little bit of acreage, um, we noticed that the goats will go after the cedar between December and April, but never touch it the rest of the year. So in some other areas, they'll t eat cedar all year long. It just depends. It's just really strange. So you have to observe what they're doing. Um, their diet selection, by this table you can kind of see um, that the different species of animals um, prefer different, uh, different um, percentages, different types of diet. Um, and you can see where goats prefer mostly browse um, with broadleaf weeds and legumes, but grass and grasses, they can take it or leave it. Um, sheep, though, have a higher preference for grass um, and broadleaf plants rather than browse, the woody stem stuff, as opposed to horses and cattle. Um, goats tend to be opportunistic grazers. Uh, they, like, they prefer woody browse, plants and shrubs, um, vines. Again, poison ivy seems to be their favorite. Uh, multifloral rose. Uh, Blackberries, whether you want to grow them for a product or they're a nuisance. <laughs> um, not so, I haven't had trouble with my goats getting out and eating my flower beds, though. That's one thing I noticed. And the sheep will clean your flower beds out. Um, they're not big fans of clover so much as um, sheep and cattle would be. Um, but they'll eat it if they have to. Again, goats tend to prefer having their heads up when they graze, not their heads down close to the ground. So they kind of want to keep up above. But we force them to graze closer to the ground because we tend to want everything on a pasture and we want it to look like a golf course. Um, they have, like I said earlier, a higher tolerance for tannins and bitter compounds, um, fewer problems with plant toxicities. They tend to be more tolerant of a lot of the plant toxicities, so they'll eat plants that other animals can't tolerate. For sheep, basically, they're more of a forb grass browse, but they'll eat browse, especially the hair sheep. The hair sheep are incredible browsers, um, so th this kind of would prefer, I guess, go more with the wool sheep will be more like this, but the Hair sheep tend, to, I, my observation, have been more of a browser as well. They're just not as aggressive and they won't jump up and knock things over like goats will. Um, they will graze close to the ground. Um, so I've seen a lot of places with sheep and it's down to almost the dirt because they don't rotate or they don't pay attention to their. Um, and I have to pass a place like that every day. Oh, wow. Every day when I drive to work. And so. Um, it's really, I kind of just shudder, but anyway. Um, and they can tolerate more salty compounds. So to control brush and weeds, basically you want to defoliate it every six weeks or less. Um, you'll defoliate it late in the fall because as long as you kind of inhibit that photosynthesis process, it can't re um, leaf out, I guess is what we want to say. We want to kind of control that. But the one thing you want to think about is at this point when you wipe out all your brushes, what are you going to do then? You're going to have to go to a different species um, of livestock if you're maintaining grass, if grasses come back up in those after the brush is all gone. So you need to figure out what you're going to do after you wipe out everything. To manage the brush as a renewable resource, you'll start grazing later in the spring, allow it plenty of time to leaf out. Um, and then have longer rotation, rest rotations, so it can come and leaf out um, and flourish as well. Uh, keeping that in a, a nice early or um, leafy time will increase the protein and makes it more protein available. So if you can keep that regenerating and giving it plenty of time to rest, which is about 30, about six to eight weeks, and then put the goats and sheep back in there, rotate them through. And don't defoliate in the fall so it comes back in the spring and you can sustain it. These are some um, of the type of plants uh, sheep and goats prefer, um, complements of Dr. Hart as well. <laughs> and plants to caution. There are some things here that um, fescue, I was doing some research on fescue and looking at the effects of fescue on sheep and goats and reproduction. I have a gut feeling there's something there, just like with cattle. Um, but 
our uh, funding ran out before we could really get any substantial results. Uh, stone fruit trees like wild cherries, be cautious of wild cherries that you have in your woods. Um, they're pretty toxic to almost any livestock, goats included. <coughs> Uh, other considerations, you've got to consider your fencing, predator control, parasites, of course, um, and your management, low input and lambing versus and kidding. Um, make it a business. There's several places across the country now that are doing this as businesses and offering contractual work mm -hmm. to get their goats and sheep out there to um, clean up people's places. I have about four or five people that call me every year asking if I'm going to do that, and I'm just, I can't, I don't have enough time. I live between here and Ashland, Missouri, so um, I spend most of my time on the highway anymore. Um, but you can take it into consideration as a possible side business. You can check with your local government regulations, make sure you've got the right permits for the right situation, uh, devise a business plan, uh, you're going to have to have a schedule for checking your animals. I prefer that I recommend you check them daily, make sure nothing's going wrong. Um, as soon as you ignore them a day, things go south pretty fast. You've got to consider the t cost of your transporting them, time to set up your fence, a fee for per head. Some, um, I have a colleague from Lincoln University who actually does this in Kansas City area with her sheep, and she charges a fee per head. She charges for her time to set up and take down, and she charges per mile how far she has to travel. And liability insurance. I don't know if you remember, in, okay, one minute. In a, a few years ago, back in California, somebody's goats got out on the highway. They were doing just this, the fence went down, and they got out on the highway, and a truck hit them and wiped out quite a few goats and sheep all over the highway in California. Um, but you'd be liable for that, so that's something that you need to think about. Uh, here are the, some targeted grazing affiliations in the different states. These are people that have started these businesses. Um, Guts on the Go is up here in Iowa, and they're actually employing affiliation people um, here in Missouri. Um, one of my clients has just signed up with them as an affiliation for doing Central Missouri. Um, but anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting, and so, and, uh, then here's some resources I think are pretty good for you to refer to. Langston University has an incredible website that I encourage everybody to visit um, on management. And it might be concentrated on goats, but it applies to sheep. I used to raise sheep long before I got involved with goats, and that was a pretty easy transition over. Um, we have the American Consortium Small Ruminant Parasite Control, anything and everything that has been thought of and needs to be thought of on parasite control and small ruminants is done by the folks on this website. Um, there's a whole panel of them. We have four of them here. I think, are you still on the yeah. consortium, Dr. Luganbold? Yeah, and Terry, aren't you? And Dr. Hart and um, Joan? <laughs> I saw you back there too. <laughs> put you guys on the spot, but anyway, and, and down the, and all of these guys up in front. Um, so you've got a lot of people here that study the parasite cycle in the small ruminants. Um, E-Extension, goat and sheep industry websites, those are up there for um, people to access as a reference, and quite a few of us in here are undercover, but we contribute to that, <laughs> that website. Maryland has an excellent website on sheep. Um, the University of Idaho and the American sheep industry have a lot of information on targeted grazing, if that's what you want to do. And the toxic plant website is pretty conclusive as well. And I think that's it. Good job. <laughs> I got it done. <laughs> <laughs>